Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 22nd, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussions with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the missing question so far in the Alaska election campaigns and why we think it's the most important. Second, the underlying truth facing the university, whoever is in charge. And third, why we are surprised and disappointed the state appears ready to approve the Hillcorp stale without being transparent with Alaskans about the terms. And now, let's join Michael. Lots of things on the plate, and of course, first and foremost is, I mean, it's election season. It's officially down deep. It's into the election season. We're ready to go. And we've got a lot of Republican on Republican action going on here. And even James Brooks has picked up on this with a with an article and even mentions the uh, binding caucus. But there's some missing questions, you say, and let's talk a little bit about that. Well, James Brooks's article, uh, I think, is a good way to set the plate of, uh, of where things line up in the primaries. It was a good analysis of of the Republican primaries and some of the issues that are showing up in the in the Republican primaries. There's one issue, uh, though, that I think is an overriding issue from a fiscal standpoint that, uh, that James doesn't hit in this article. Hopefully he will in future articles. But I think I think it's also reflective of what I'm seeing thus far from candidates. Uh, James, uh, it, the missing issue that the candidates aren't, aren't talking about either. James does a good article, uh, does a good uh, focus on the, the PFD being an issue between uh, uh, between candidates. For example, the Rob Myers, uh, John Coghill race um, uh, in particular, uh, and focusing on the PFD issue in that race. But but here here's the issue to me that's missing, and that is how are you going to close uh, the fiscal gap? Part of what's going on, I think, is that is that people still have not absorbed the, the radical change that we've had in the state's fiscal situation over the last two years. To go back to a, to a chart that you and I talked about a few weeks ago, um, FY19, the last year of the Walker administration, the last budget of the Walker administration, uh, oil was at $69 a barrel uh, during that uh, fiscal year. Traditional revenues were at 2.75 billion, total revenues counting uh, POMV 5050 were at 4.4.11 billion. There was a deficit of 780 million dollars, but it was it was a, a, only a deficit of 780 million dollars. In in FY 21, the current fiscal year that we're going that we go into July 1, oil is at 37 dollars. Uh, that's 32 dollars um, uh, down from where it was in the last Walker budget. Traditional revenues. Uh, are at 1.15 billion as opposed to 2.75 billion. That's down 58 percent. Um, and the deficit uh, in FY21 with POMV at 50/50 is uh, is 1.9.1.92 billion dollars, nearly two billion dollars, instead of 780 million dollars. So when you when we when we in the past have talked about you know, what we need to focus on are cuts, what we need to focus on are reducing spending. We can get down to uh, a reasonable budget uh, by by doing that. Uh, that's that's not on the table anymore uh, in the in the current revenue environment, in the current oil price environment. 
and and neither the futures market nor any of the um, prognosticators uh, out there are, are looking at uh, an increase or a return in oil prices back to uh, the level that uh, that applied during the Walker administration or indeed even this past fiscal year uh, uh, when oil prices were at fifty two dollars average fifty two dollars over the fiscal year that that's that's created a huge hole uh, in the in the state's fiscal situation. So when candidates talk about, I mean, when candidates talk about the PFD, that's an important issue, critical issue, an issue that that I think has has huge importance. Um, but it's only part of the equation. I mean, the question is, how are you going to close this fiscal gap? How are you going to close a fiscal gap uh, of 1.9.2 billion dollars? And when you look, this isn't this isn't a one year thing. When you look uh, at the spring revenue forecast and apply that. Uh, going out um, and 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 cap spending at inflation, which is what uh, von Imhoff and others' bills have have proposed, the governor's bill proposed to do. Uh, you're looking at deficits of against the statutory dividend. You're looking at deficits of 2.3, 2.27, an average over the next 10 years of a 2.3 a 2.3 billion dollar deficit. So this isn't a one year a one year issue. And and so when when you, we get into the campaigns. And and the focus is on the PFD. I understand, I appreciate, and I support uh, those who say uh, don't tax the PFD, don't cut the PFD. Right. But you've got to then have another answer for how you're going to close the fiscal gap. When when Coghill and Giesel are talking about uh, the way forward, um, they're doing it wrong. But at least they have an answer for how they're going to close the fiscal gap, which is to cut the PFD. Indeed, probably eliminate the PFD if if uh, if we keep going the direction we're going. The candidates, the candidates in response um, to that, the candidates who are proposing to to save the PFD as 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 I as I urge them to do, uh, and others certainly urge them to do. But the candidates in response have to have a fiscal plan, uh, and they have to be re to, to be responsible to to. to really lay the cards on the table with their constituents to really give their constituents an understanding of, of what we're facing. They have to they have to say what else they're going to do or else or else we're walking into this next legislative session with with not even half an answer. Uh, right. we, it, we're, we're walking into the next legislation le, legislative session with a huge deficit and and no 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 defined plans that have come out during the campaign about what we're going to do about it. Well, I mean, I think that's that that's been the biggest problem is that nobody has really looked to the, you know, to the future. I mean, this has been a historical problem for legislatures going back uh, the last couple decades. It was always uh, when they had the money, it was spend, spend, spend. Really not much of a thought for the future. It'll always be high cotton season. And then when it was not high cotton season, then they would pray for the for the for the for the gods to bring the oil prices back. And we, you know, we'll. We'll we'll panic and we we'll, won't think about it. But nobody's really been giving this long term consideration of the unintended consequences of what they're doing, and and we've just run out of road, right? I mean, this is just it. There's just nothing left in the bank, no more blood in the stone, and so they're now being faced with these hard issues that they could have faced years ago and softened the blow. Yeah, exactly right. And to some degree, you know, the, the elections of 2014, 2016, 2018, uh, you could say. Uh, you know, you can sort of give this half an answer and hope and pray that it would be resolved during the legislative cycle. But you can sort of give and pray, get, give this half answer because you still had the cushion of savings uh, sitting underneath us. I mean, we started out with with nearly 20 between the SBR and the CBR. We started out with nearly uh, 20 billion dollars in savings that, that we've now that we've now run through in the last years. Uh, and so you could in those campaigns, you could sort of say, look. Let's save the PFD. We need to get a fiscal answer. Let's do the fiscal answer. But 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 knowing that you had savings, you had this safety net sitting underneath, underneath you. We don't have that safety net right. anymore. The the current projection, uh, both LegFin, Legislative Finance, and OMB are now saying the uh, uh, the the uh, CBR, the remaining balance in the CBR, is going to be underneath a billion dollars by the end of this coming fiscal year. Um, and so there's no there's no and, and and that's in the context of looking at two billion plus deficits, um, uh, not only uh, FY 22, which is the fiscal year that that people are going to be addressing when they go to Juno, 
uh, not only uh, in, in that fiscal year, but every fiscal year, uh, the remainder of the decade, we have we have two billion plus dollar deficits, and we have less than five hundred million dollars remaining in the piggy bank at the F of, at the end of FY21. So there's no there's no safety net uh, underneath the high wire uh, anymore. And and one of the things that that I think constituents, I think Alaskans need to need to be need to focus on this election cycle is there is no safety net. We are uh, facing these these tremendous deficits. This election is about who you're going to send to Juno to deal with that situation. Um, and and you have to evaluate the different candidates' plans. And as I say, as bad as they are, at least Giesel and Coghill and others are putting out a plan. They're saying eliminate the PFD and just take all that revenue into state government. Those who are who are defending the PFD need to say what they're going to do instead uh, of cutting the PFD. And you know maybe they'll say maybe they'll say I'm going to cut I'm going to cut government by 50 percent uh, because that's what it would take uh, to do this on a cuts only basis. Um, and and then and then legislators or or, or, or or voters can evaluate whether they think that's realistic and whether they think that holds up. But but there there that that additional question is a question that I think. Voters need to be asking, and I think James Brooks and other need, needs to be talking about uh, as we uh, as we continue through this election cycle. Well, and I think that's the you know that's that's the bottom line. At least if they had an answer, then the voters could decide. Uh, if they had an answer and it was restore the PFD and cut government, or restore the PFD and cut government in part and tax in part, or just restore the PFD and just institute taxes, at least people could then make a valid decision on 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 the variety of choices but we, but it can't be done alone i think that's the thing to remember they're going to have to have help and so we've got to find candidates that are all kind of of like mind to be able to go in there and make those changes that need to be made yeah the the next question for a candidate who says i'm going to do it by cutting government 50 percent the next question is how are you going to get 21 and 11 um uh, in order to do that in the legislature or uh, worst case, is the governor going to cut government by 50 percent, and are you? How are you going to get 16 to back that up? Because we didn't have that uh, uh, when the governor tried to do it before. He wasn't even trying to cover, cut it. He's trying to cut it by about a billion dollars, and we didn't even have 16 to back that up. So, it's. I mean, there there's a series of questions that go on, but the first the first focus has to be how are you going to address uh, this this much larger fiscal gap? Right. Uh, double the fiscal gap uh, than what we had uh, uh, the last election cycle. No, I mean, I think it's a valid question. I mean, if you if you say, you know, you I mean, I want the PFD restored, but you do have to have an answer to that big elephant in the room, which is the deficit of, you know, one point five to two billion dollars moving forward. What is that? You know, what's your answer to that? I think that's a valid question. And I think the third valid question should be, again, uh, James Brooks got a chance to touch on it, but on the binding caucus, I think that that, again, is the underlying problem of all of our woes. And I think those three questions would be dynamite three questions to ask each candidate. You know, where, what do you stand on the PFD? How are you going to fill the budget gap? And do you support the binding caucus? That'll pretty give you a pretty give you a, a pretty good idea of what each candidate stands for. Yeah, it, I agree. In, I agree. In the but end. it has to be it has to be those three questions. I mean, it, it can't be just how do you stand on the PFD? Uh, right. And and, you know, how do you feel about the binding caucus? You, you, candidates to, to, to be fair to voters, um, uh, to not be disingenuous with voters, candidates need to be talking about how they're going to deal with that. Right. With that fiscal gap. It's not a question that James Brooks asked, but but I think it's a question that 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 he will be asking as this election cycle develops. And I hope candidates will be talking about it. Let me go back into the chat room here and see if I can. Uh... Uh, see if I can talk with uh, w or see what the f other folks are saying. Um, you could point to anything you want when you talk to the people, but if they aren't willing to spend less, you'll never convince people that cutting the PFD is the way. They can't expect the government to write whatever checks they want, and we take the hit to pay for it all. And I think that's the feeling for many and most conservatives is that's where it's at. That's why they've been saying we need to cut government. The problem is is that we've created this dependency state in many ways where people are dependent on the government. And uh, if they lose a little money in the dividend but gain thousands of dollars in services, they're okay with it. Am I wrong, Brad? No, you're, you're right, Michael. But but what's what I think is missing in terms of appreciation is how much – 
the 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 environment has changed in the last two years. This isn't a rerun of the of the 2018 campaign, and we're and we're trying one more time to 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 get people to you know face up to the to, to what they're doing with PFD cuts, and then we can cut the budget to to offset that. This this is not 2018 rerun. In 2018, the 2018 campaign, which was run during the during uh, fiscal year uh, 2019. We had 4.11 billion in revenues in, in fiscal year 19. Oil was at $69. Now in FY21, which is which is what's coming up, oil's at $37, and we have 2.7 billion in revenues. When we were at 4.1 billion in revenues, it was realistic to think that uh, you could you could you know do spending cuts, and we also had. We also had you know, savings still left in the in 2018, so it was it was realistic to think you could bring spending down to, to that 4.1 level uh, and use savings, the remaining savings, to sort of to sort of glide path you down. It'd be a quick glide path, but glide path you down to, to 4.1. That's not where we are anymore. We are we are we are in in in, a, in an environment where the project projection is $37 oil as opposed to 69. Uh, and where projected revenues are 2.7, and where we're out of savings. So e even if you say, if, if, if it was appropriate to say in 2018, I'm going to cut the budget to match revenues and preserve the PFD, even if it was appropriate to say that in 2018, if that's what you said in 2018, you can't say that in 2019 or, or 2020 because the revenues are just entirely different. The, the environment is entirely different. Uh, Harold, of course, uh, wants to take exception with what you're saying. He says, no one I know is proposing a 50% government a cut to government. Brad is the only one uttering a 50% cut to government. Fear politics for attacks. Uh, but again, I mean, I think you're, you just laid out the reasoning why um, that, I mean, if you literally wanted to get to where revenues equals expenditures, there's no soft landing. There's no soft way to do it because there is no more savings on top of this and even if even if oil goes up to 40 or 45 you're still facing these billion dollar deficits uh with the fully with, with a fully funded pfd if you support that and there's really no way to soft uh, soften the blow so where do you cut if it's not down to you know 35 40 40 50 percent of government where where do you find those revenues yeah exactly where you find the revenues i mean if if Harold isn't saying Harold and others aren't saying a fifty percent cut cut to government, then where are they going to find the revenues to uh, uh, to to fund the the level of government that they've not cut to fifty percent? Let's say they're going to cut it ten percent. Uh, we have one candidate out there who says he's going to cut it five percent per year. Okay, fine. Uh, but where uh, are you going to find the revenues to fund that? There there isn't any savings left uh, to 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 throw at the dike. Uh, to plug the dike and uh, and 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 pay and pay the bills. If you're not going to make the cuts, then where are are the revenues going to? If if you're gonna if you're not going to make the cuts, you're going to pay a full PFD. Then where are the revenues going to come from to uh, uh, to pay the bills? Because the the money the money isn't there, and it's not magically going to appear. There is no uh, uh, oil price cavalry or oil uh, volume cavalry coming over the hill. Harold says there's $400 million going into oil property taxes, real increases from K-12, 1998 inflation adjusted is over $2 million. The UAA system is an annual $800 million spend, $400 million over four years can be realistically done. But the university contribution is only $270 million right now. So, I mean, there's some, there's some questions as to whether or not that's viable. And, and I think the biggest question that you brought up is how do you, even if you say we're going to do it over 10 years, is how do we live, or, or four years, it, how do we live for those four years? Okay, great. You cut $200 million or $100 million or you cut $100 million a year. How do you live with no savings over that interim time while you're trying to reduce the budget slowly instead of all in one fell swoop. And that, I think that's the problem that nobody ever is. Nobody's ever really addressing, uh, Brad. Yeah, no, exactly right. Michael. I mean that we, you used to be able to skip over that because we had the CBR. We still had it. Well, in the beginning we had the SBR and the CBR, and then we had the CBR after we drained the SBR uh, to, to cushion it through. So you can sort of make those statements, but now we've drained the CBR. We drained the SBR. 
Um, and, and there's really no savings left uh, uh, to, to, to go to. I mean, you're going to tax somebody. If, if, if the answer is we're going to take it out of the ERA, then you're taxing future generations. If the answer is we're going to take it out of the PFD, then we're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, and if the answer is uh, uh, we're going to we're going to cut the budget uh, uh, to, to, to recognize that uh, immediately the, to, to, to avoid, uh, you know, to, to recognize the fact we don't have savings, then, you know, it's a 50 percent cut. And how are you going to get 21 and 11? It's it is. It, it is it is a hard problem. I mean, I, I don't want to diminish I don't want to diminish the problem. And, and and you have to you have to have to say things that people don't want to hear, like taxes. Uh, but it it's a problem that this this set of candidates has to address in order to be honest with voters. Um, uh, they're not going they're not being honest with voters if they come in and they say I'm going to save the PFD um, and I'm uh, and, and I'm going to you know avoid taxes. Uh, and I'm still going to balance the budget. I mean, okay, that means a 50% cut. Tell us how you're going to get a 50% tell, cut. Tell us how you're going to get 21 plus 11 uh, uh, in order to in order to make that cut. I, y y y candidates have to confront it, uh, and uh, candidates who try to slide by talking about magical things like taking 400 million dollars from uh, uh, the boroughs uh, in property taxes and upstreaming them to the state. And creating a problem down in the boroughs, uh, candidates who say those magical things, okay, fine. How do you get 21 and 11? You couldn't even get a hearing on this issue in the legisla legislature. Not not a hearing, much less getting 20, getting close to 21 and 11. So how are you going to get 21 and 11 for that? Right. And candidates candidates need to be honest about that, or else or else they're not realistic candidates. Um, and and I think that's the thing. I mean, I do believe that. I mean, I would be willing to draw personally if it was me and I was, you know, the king for a day. I would be willing to, with a good sound plan, be willing to draw from the ERA over a period of two or three years to soften the blow. But uh, some aren't. And there's got to be some kind of plan out there to be able to make it happen. I mean, as far as the Citizens Initiative saying that we're going to get another billion dollars or $500 million a year, uh, that, of course, is if it passes and if it doesn't have a long-term effect on the investment in oil and things like that here in the state, uh, that could be diminishing returns in the long run. So, I mean, you you know, you've got unintended consequences of all those things. Well, and the other thing, Michael, is the one point two billion dollar projection they have out of the out of the out of the oil tax is based upon sixty dollar oil. We don't have sixty dollar oil. Right. We have thirty seven dollar oil. That's that's the projection for this coming fiscal year. So it's not. 1.2 billion dollars and even if it were 1.2 billion dollars that doesn't close a 2 billion dollar gap. Yeah. So you 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 can't you can't throw these things out. You got to you got to make the math work. To be a serious candidate, you've got to make the math work. Yep. Brad Keithley, uh Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Let me see. Uh Bill Bill in the chat room says, "Whoops, I just went went right by it." Bill in the chat room says, uh, uh I'm sorry, I'm waiting for my I want to make sure I quote it properly, and my my deal is lagging here. Never taxers are going to guarantee the end of the PFD and still fail in preventing an income tax, which I think is kind of essentially what you're what you're saying here, right, Brad? I mean, we can live in the pie in the sky land of we don't want any new taxes, we don't want any new revenues, but we're gonna we're gonna be able to live. But and that's all well good. It makes a great bumper sticker and a campaign slogan. But you've got to deliver it on the other end. And unless we change out a dozen of the players in the legislature, it, it, the likelihood of it happening is fairly small. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it's. I agree with Bill. Never taxers are playing right into the hands of Coghill and Geisel, who say, "Well, you don't. We don't want to tax. You don't want to tax." The only place we've got to go, the only place left we've got to go is to cut the PFD, to tax middle and lower income Alaska families because you don't want to tax uh, uh, anybody else on a more on a more equitable, equitable basis. I mean, that's 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 what these numbers are driving us to. There is no savings setting underneath us anymore. There is no revenue uh, at thirty seven dollar oil that's going to magically enable us to pay for government of the size that. The, the, even even if we cut it back of the size that people are willing to vote for, um, and so you're squeezing out you're squeezing out uh, uh, the other revenue source that could be used to replace uh, PFD cuts, and you're leaving the state with no option other than to make additional PFD cuts. Yeah, so it's a great observation. 
Uh, number two, the university. Uh, Jim Johnson steps away. Uh, now, the crowing from the uh, university faculty union basically saying, this is what we wanted, this is what we asked for, we're glad he listened to us. Of course, this whole thing is over, uh, this whole thing is over the fact that the budget cuts continue. And I had to laugh because it seems like in the article that they they seem to feel like if we just had somebody else in there, they could have gotten more money. Uh, but there's going to be problems facing whoever comes in there to fill that gap. Yeah, uh, Johnson, you know, stepped in it when he went out to Wisconsin. Not only did he lose the Wisconsin job, but in the interview he gave, he he gave enough ammunition for people back here to sort of say, well, don't don't come back home either. Right. Um, you're right. He's been he sort of he is sort of personalized uh, or 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 been the target for. Uh, the budget cuts and people have been upset with him because because of the budget cuts. They aren't going away. Tim Bradner, even before Johnson resigned, uh, had a, a piece in the ADN that I think uh, has I, that I disagree with in, in in some parts. I think Tim went over the edge in some parts, but but this particular sentence I think uh, really captures exactly the situation. So he says, uh, "I know this is complicated. I appreciate th appreciate that there will be strong opinions about what should be." what should be in standardized courses, and that's understandable. However, this transition is going to happen because budgets will require it. And that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the inconvenient truth uh, about this situation. Replacing Johnson does nothing uh, with respect, to, with respect to, to budgets. It doesn't create any more revenue for the state. It doesn't create any less pressure. Uh, for uh, for state government to be finding places to reduce costs, to increase efficiencies, to uh, to to reduce uh, reduce spending. Is it just me, or does it seem like uh, you know everybody is like in celebratory mode over at the university? Like, hey, the university uh, unions, the faculty union said, hey, you finally did what you said. Good for you for listening to us, for resigning, and doing all this other kind of stuff. But I mean, at this point, it's just I mean, this is a thankless task. That is is made harder by the fact that the government is just I mean, the, the governor's compact and everything else. They're just not getting any more money. And it seems like many of these folks who are complaining and and now celebrating are thinking that they'll put somebody else in there and somehow those folks will will carve more money out of the state. I mean, does this mean that they want to put somebody in there who's adversarial to the governor instead of as Johnson has been had a kind of a cordial relationship and has been working with the governor? Does it, is that what you see here? Do you see that there's maybe going to be some kind of adversarial deal where they go on a crusade against the governor from the university, uh, pr you know, presidency? Maybe, but that won't be effective. I mean, the the numbers we just went over the numbers. The numbers are what the numbers are. We don't have the revenue uh, to be able to support the university at the level at which uh, at which it's been supported in the past, or even at the level uh, that it's currently being supported. It, realistically, here's what. Um, uh, he, here's the effect of Johnson's resignation. They don't create any more revenue, um, so so there's not going to be the, the the revenue cavalry isn't going to be coming over the hill. Um, they're not going to even slow down the, the the rate of cut because we don't have the money. The state doesn't have the money as we just went through. The state doesn't have the money to slow uh, down the rate of cut. In fact, if anything, because of this drop in revenues, the rate of cut. Uh, has to has to move along faster uh, after we get out of the three year agreement that uh, uh, that the governor made uh, with the university. The cuts aren't going to stop at the end of that three years. So they didn't they didn't change that. All they really changed was the process, uh, and maybe not even that. But they 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 changed they potentially changed the process by which the university is evaluating how it's going to make these cuts. Johnson was an advocate of consolidation. Uh, he was he was trying to get the board to see that, that there really weren't that there really weren't any other good alternatives to consolidation. That was a good way to to resolve the uh, uh, the best way to resolve the spending cuts. Uh, they may get somebody in there that that looks at that issue differently and maybe says, okay, we're not going to have one great university. We're going to have three mediocre universities, and we're just going to make the cuts by each university uh, continuing to step down until, uh, until you know, the aggregate is, is, is what we get uh, in revenues. 
um, maybe maybe that's where the change is. But but if if those who are who, those who are viewing Johnson's resignation as an opportunity to increase revenues or even to stabilize revenues at current levels, I, that's just not realistic. The revenues the revenues aren't there. Uh, uh, for the state, for the state to, to step up. I mean, as we've talked before, the revenue drop since 2018 has been so dramatic that even if you take, you eliminate the PFD and convert all of the PFD to government, you still don't have enough revenues to pay for um, uh, spending, uh, uh, state spending uh, capped at inflation, um, and 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 the university. Uh, the, the, the savings from the, the agreement between the administration and the university is part of, uh, is, is baked into those numbers. It's part of how we, how we deal with, uh, deal with spending going forward. So, so there's no room for increase, uh, increase back to the university. There's no room even to, to, to hold the numbers at, at the current level. And, and as, as, uh, uh, as, as Tim Bradner said in his piece, this transition is going to happen because budgets will require it, regardless, regardless of who the university president is. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I mean, this is obviously not a problem we're going to fix in any uh, in any uh, you know few minutes here. But I got to tell you, Brad, uh, whoever else is going to take that chair is going to be faced with these hard budget questions. And I know nobody wants to talk about consolidation, but it is the fastest way to uh, uh to cut into the government budget without cutting into the core programs you know without cutting into the the classes and everything else taking out that overhead but it just seems there's so much pushback because there are so many fiefdoms that are affected by it i just don't see you know i don't think that anybody who has who's going to take this position is going to you know have to is going to be publicly for it because it's just it's so unpopular at this point yeah, and somebody made the comment yesterday, and it's and it's accurate. It's it's not it's not just Johnson that really. It's not just the presidency that needs to uh, you know, needs to confront that reality. It's the board also. I mean, the board has been part of one of the situations Johnson's had to deal with. There are people on the board who want to continue the three university system, who who you know think we ought to you know find more revenues for the university. Uh, although they're uh, although they're they're not out raising it themselves, uh, but think we ought to find more revenues for the university. And it's just, I mean, it, it's a it's a difficult situation, uh, uh, not only for the president but for the board. The board needs to get get real. And I and I frankly I think one of the one of the things that's happening with this process is the board slowly, uh, with a lot of resistance, but the board is becoming more real. I mean, it's the board who approved continuing to look at the consolidation of southeast uas uh into uh, into uaf so i think the board is becoming more real but it, it, it whoever becomes president will have to deal with a board that's not been particularly right. helpful as well as faculty right well let's move on to number three here we've got about four minutes four and a half minutes i don't know if you can fit it all in what sideboards have been put on this new hill corp deal with bp uh, you have some thoughts on this, obviously. Let's uh, let's crack into it. Well, so there was an article yesterday in uh, Alaska Public Media um, on their website and, and on their radio broadcast that the headline of which is DNR to complete its review of BP sale this week. There are two major regulatory approvals required for uh, the closing of the BP Hillcorp deal. One is DNR that controls Department of Natural Resources that can controls the transfer of the upstream properties. The other is the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, the RCA, that controls the transfer of the midstream properties, uh, basically TAPS, BP's interest in TAPS. Um, they've been on different tracks, um, and, and it appears that they will continue to be on different tracks. I think there's a problem. We've talked about it on past shows with them being on different tracks, but they are on different tracks. And now it appears that DNR is uh, uh, in process to complete its review and to, and evidently to uh, approve the sale. Here, here's my here's my issue with that. When we did Arco, when we did Arco BP, uh, the Arco BP merger back in 2000, there was a huge public process, a lot of transparency, a lot of discussion about what. Uh, factors should be taken into account by the state in imposing conditions on the sale. A lot of discussion around that. Um, and I think, you know, there was a lot of discussion, but I think at the end, the state came to a very good set of sideboards 
about what needed to be uh, what needed to be uh, incorporated into that uh, transaction. It was it was uh, uh, put in a document called uh, uh, the the uh, just went out of my mind, but it was put in put in a document. Uh, an agreement between the state and BP uh, and ConocoPhillips ultimately about what those conditions ought to be. We've seen none of that process in the state's review of the BP Hillcorp transaction, and that bothers me uh, because one, we don't know what's going on. It's especially problematic because Hillport, Hillcorp's a private company, and we've not seen any of the uh, any of the financials uh, sitting behind Hillcorp, uh, and we've not seen uh, whether the state if has imposed, if any conditions on the on the on the sale well uh it'll be interesting to see what details do come out i know you've been kind of a watchdog on this and wanting to hear more about what they're going to be doing with it because it's such a big part of the alaskan oil scene uh and we'll have to see what comes out of this uh, review and if we get any more information on it brad keithley uh, alaskans for sustainable budgets brad we're coming up into the election season here i got about 30 seconds uh, anything you're going to be watching, anything you think people should be watching as the election season progresses? Yep, absolutely. We, we need to go back to the to the first segment, which is uh, what are the candidates, how are the candidates going to close the fiscal gap? How are the candidates dealing with the fiscal gap? They first have to acknowledge, I mean, to, to be a serious candidate to me, a candidate has to acknowledge that there is this huge fiscal gap. And second, they have to have a plan, a workable plan not just a pie in the sky plan, a workable plan for how they're going to deal with that fiscal gap going forward. All right. And of course, asking them those three questions, what are your thoughts? You know, do you support the PFD? How do you close the fiscal gap? And do you support the binding caucus? Those should be the questions that we are asking. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.